with that, I am going to hand it over to Katrina. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and to share a little bit uh, of research findings that really, I think, take some of what Bruce has been talking about with this practice and tacit knowledge and can blend it with what the literature and some emerging evidence is, is saying about what we can do, um, what are the most promising practices for communicating health equity and working with our data. So I'll just start by saying that um, the work that I'm presenting today is from my doctoral research, uh, which was supported by CHR Banting and Best Canada Graduate Scholarship. And I would like to acknowledge my amazing supervisory committee, all of whom have given me incredible support and mentorship along the way. And also just to say too that um, I'm fortunate to live in and work in the beautiful Okanagan Valley, Valley in British Columbia, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Silk Nation. Um, and so I'm a privileged guest in this, in this land. So I started, um, my do the, what I'm presenting today is a, a small piece um, of a focus piece from my doctoral work. And really, um, the reason that I pursued the questions I had for my doctoral research are similar to some of the things Bruce was talking about, about feeling um, very, very committed to health equity, uh, but being immersed in fields where it didn't really seem like the work that we were doing wasn't always aligned with what I, it, it did, we just encountered a lot of tensions and contradictions. And I think one of the things that um, was important for me to pay attention to as I started to, to explore the research questions for my doctoral work um, and continues to be, is just to be very attentive to the lenses that we're looking at the world through because the lens that we choose really shapes how we see and what we see and how we understand it. And sometimes we don't realize uh, what lens we're using. And sometimes because we're immersed in fields that, that train us in particular ways or expose us to particular lenses without necessarily naming them as a lens, it can be very um, easy to forget that there's even a lens there. And so we may not even be conscious of how narrowed our perception of or what we're seeing um, may be. And so my doctoral work, I'm trying to advance the slides and I have moved my, um, really asked the question about what can we do? What are the things, the how things, the promising practices, those everyday things that we can do to connect knowledge to action for health equity? And this is based on an assumption that um, the, the persistence of health inequities is a knowledge to action gap. It's a, it's a problem of communicating and connecting knowledge to action and motivating action more than it is a problem of knowing what the causes of inequities are because those causes are very well documented and very well understood. Um, so with that in mind, I, looked, I did three different studies and I looked at what the literature had to say and I looked to KT and health equity experts to see what they had to say. And today I'm focusing on results uh, that came from a blend of a critical interpretive synthesis and um, the series of critically reflective dialogic interviews that I did. And just to say to the scoping review, um, that study looked quite closely at what the patterns and trends were and how um, health inequities were being framed. So I was really trying to see in the field of health equity when we have an explicit intention um, of connecting knowledge to action, what lenses are being used. And so that scoping review was published um, just in December in Critical Public Health. And if anyone's interested, in fact, I'll, um, I'll make sure that the citations for those are available to anyone uh, interested afterwards. So I'll be sharing just the results from the two, the critical interpretive synthesis and the dialogue. And um, all of the literature that I looked at in the critical interpretive synthesis, there were 32 articles that were included. And all of these articles were considered promising because they adopted a particular lens that framed health inequities as problematic. Um, they framed them as having causes. They were um, explicit in identifying health inequities as something that were 
some, or is something unfair and actionable. They made an effort to link that to political economy. And um, all of the authors uh, for those articles said something about how health inequities were embedded in social systems of power. Um, so this was in contrast to articles that would have been excluded if they in any way naturalized health inequities um, by not referring to their causes, by, um, by leaving them as sort of naming inequities, but leaving them as a mysterious or the result of bad luck, for example, of the, the bad luck of being born into a country where there's a higher, higher prevalence of infectious disease. Um, the other ways that, that we can naturalize health inequities is when we tend to use a lens that helps us focus more on symptoms um, than on causes, or when we tend to um, place the blame, we, we use a lens that focuses on individuals and places the blame or responsibility for health inequities in individuals rather than uh, on their root causes. So one way that this is sometimes accomplished is by using um, culture or ethnicity as a determinant of health rather than looking at um, isms like racism as a determinant of health. And just another way to um, just say how, what I was looking at, the articles in the critical interpretive synthesis were all chosen because of their more productive orientation towards causes of health inequities. So when I looked at literature, I assessed them for how did the research study orient themselves to those root causes? What were they trying to do about them? And I, um, I grouped them in articles that were progressively less productive and articles that were progressively more productive in terms of how they were oriented towards those root causes. And I think that when we're trying to talk about advancing health equity action, what really, based on the evidence about what causes health inequities, really our gaze needs to be turned towards, um, at a minimum, illuminating something new about how health inequities are are working in society or within populations, um, and especially to to make attempts to be more interventional in our designs and to work towards disrupting those root causes so that we can actually alter the conditions that are contributing to root causes. So all of the articles that were included um, in the, and that gave uh, rise to the data I'm going to share with you now, all were in this progressively more productive orientation range. And this tool that I use to assess the um, orientations toward root causes of health inequities is part of that scoping review. So if that's something that um, you're interested in, then uh, I can share it with that. Whoop. There we go. So this is a picture of my, my eight-year-old son, Kai, um, who likes to pick up lenses and look through them. And I think that um, it's a useful image to keep in mind as we start talking about what are the most promising practices for communicating data. Really, the most promising things we can do is to be very intentional about being aware of and, and then choosing or challenging ourselves to choose an equity-sensitive lens that we look at the data through. So there's two broad, um, of all the promising practices that I could identify in the literature, there are two groups that I think are really quite specific to, um, to communicating data. And the first group is, is a bit of a higher level. It has to do with how we work together. And I think that um, this is important because when we're making decisions about what data counts, what data is important or worth paying attention to and reporting on, worth monitoring and gathering, all of that can really be affected by the lens that we're looking at the world through. And if we're looking at a lens um, and we're, we're not engaging uh, in, a, in a broad way, especially if we're not engaging with people who have lived experience of inequity, sometimes we can inadvertently miss um, really important ways of thinking about that data. So this is why I think promising practices for working together are so relevant to communicating data. So the three promising practices that I could identify were around fostering connectedness, inclusion, and mitigating power imbalances. And some of these are um, things you're, you're likely already doing just based on um, the multidisciplinary representation that's here today. Um, so the more we work across disciplines and across sectors, uh, the more that we can have broaden that lens, um, the more we can work together to try and figure out what lenses we are using 
um, by creating, like, making time and place to identify and examine our assumptions. These help us to work towards creating a shared health equity lens that we can look at population health uh, problems or community health assessments, whatever it is that we're looking at, the more that we've created a shared health equity lens, the more likely it is that our lens is going to be broad. Um, and then I think the other important piece around fostering connectedness and working across sectors uh, that came out in the data was just how important it was to cultivate a culture of responsibility that is shared. So it's not just the responsibility, nor is it even possible for public health alone to take on all health equity action. The root causes of health inequities are so broad in society that we really, we really must partner beyond public health and beyond just isolated health systems. Um, when we talk about inclusion, uh, this is especially important um, to think about including non-academic or non-scientific actors and sectors. Um, and I think this is something that, at least in the fields that I'm immersed in, which are more in nursing and global health and public health, um, these are kind of novel ideas. They're not standard practices. We don't, we don't tend to think um, in a daily way about using media and being more diverse in how, what platforms we're using to communicate or how we're tying into social movements. And so I think this links into some of the, what Bruce had to say about um, considering the, that the audience that needs to hear about health equity um, or health inequities is quite broad because what we really need is greater political and public will to support health equity action. So we really need to be thinking more broadly about how we include a broader audience. And when we talk about power, really in order to talk about power, we need to be able to examine it. We need some skills to be able to examine it and understand how it might be influencing our work. So there's some really promising equity sensitive tools to assess, monitor, and purposefully elevate voices that are often excluded from these processes. And um, two that I think are really helpful that are, are originate in global health that are really quite relevant broadly uh, stem from the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research. So I work with the CCGHR quite actively, and we have a set of tools, both our partnership assessment tools and the principles for equity-centered research and knowledge translation, I think are very useful here. And then in terms of um, promising practices for knowledge translation, um, I think that the most encouraging results point to the need for integrated approaches that include and, and actively engage um, a broad range of research users along producers in ways that really honor and validate the importance of all of our different skill sets. So when I say integrated approaches, I don't mean that everybody needs to be a KT expert or everybody needs to have research skills, but um, researchers or KT experts without the partners um, of people who might be using the research or KT products that they're generating, if we don't engage actively with the audiences that we hope to use them, then we may not know what their needs are, and we might end up um, creating things that actually miss the mark. Um, another important piece of that comes back to the working together and thinking about including non-scientific and outside of health sector actors. Um, and then, really importantly, to create and package evidence in ways that share the compelling story. So numbers, we can make a particular story with numbers, um, but we've made a lot of decisions about what data counts, uh, and, and those will shape what kinds of actions um, or recommendations stem from a particular report. So when we blend in creative ways and we use um, life experience, imagery, visuals, um, things that create really evocative messages and give people an opportunity to um, connect to something on a more human level. So the more humanized our data can be, the more storied it is with life experience, with people's actual narratives, the more likely it is that that data is going to be more real and more tangible and we may be more motivated to act on it. When the numbers are just static numbers, then we actually um, have a tendency to be very disconnected from them and um, can't really, um, we, we, we end up distancing in a way that doesn't actually compel 
or motivate action. And these are such deeply rooted issues that we need to create invitational knowledge translation products that blend numbers with very evocative and empathy sparking kinds of stories. Katrina, this is Diane. Yes. Um, so a couple of people were asking if you could repeat the names of the um, power equity sensitive tools that you just mentioned. Sure, yes. Um, and I can certainly, I'm going to just type in here. You can go to here, ccchr.ca, and it says partnership assessment tool and ccchr. So these Wonderful. are tools that we use regularly. I use these tools regularly when I'm working, whenever I'm doing research, whether I'm doing it globally or locally. I use it anytime there's differences in culture, norms, power, which is virtually any time we're doing health equity work. Um, I find these very helpful. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do I have time to share this example quickly? Absolutely. OK. Sorry, I got rambly on that one slide and you get more time. <laughs> okay, so this is an example um, of how we're blending some of these um, some of these concepts or the promising practices I just shared and also we're using the CCGHR principles for global health research in this example. So I work with a team here at Interior Health with our population health team and our epidemiologists. And one of the, um, and it's a partnered project with the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health. And we have an equity challenge in um, that we would like to bring an equity lens into the opioid overdose uh, surveillance practices. So we have, um, I mean, as you know, this is a huge issue across the country and in our region in particular, we, the opioid crisis is a really, um, I don't even know the right adjective for it anymore, uh, shockingly grave. Um, so part of what is required, well, there's, there's standard and required um, and really established epidemiological surveillance practices, but there's also this really deep interest in understanding um, how we might bring more closely together the ideal of a more equity-sensitive equity or equity-centered way of thinking about the opioid crisis. And really, most importantly, how can we shift our lens so that instead of thinking about each opioid overdose as an independent event, how can we shift it to think about placing it in, um, in context and along a trajectory that is a lot more complex than a singular event? And so um, we're working with this team to, uh, and using some dialogue-based approaches um, to try and create an equity ideal kind of report that takes into consideration all of the other factors um, that you can see up in the upper right-hand corner, things like inclusion and exclusion, strengths, um, impacts on community, um, issues of access, indigeneity, racism, um, social gradients, all of these much broader contexts which are not well reflected in what's currently gathered, which is what's reflected in the lower left-hand side. And I think the other thing that we're really, um, so some of the ways we're using these practices, we're trying to really bring a more storied and humanized face to the opioid overdose surveillance reporting. And we're trying to use visuals and lived experience and other arts-based approaches to try and share um, and and reveal the story in a little bit more of an equity sensitive way. And the other thing I just will say very briefly is one of the ways that we're paying attention to equity in our lens is by really looking at how data aggregation can hide um, very real inequities. So uh, for example, if we aggregate our data and look just at the overall picture, um, the most so the population most affected by the opioid overdose crisis in our region is uh, white uh, middle-class male, male who use alone. But if we don't take gender, uh, just as Chris has just um, typed in, if we don't consider the intersections of gender and indigeneity, we actually miss that the population with the greatest burden and the most uh, rapidly increasing burden is indigenous women. So if we only looked at the data as an aggregate, we might miss the fact that the services that we're creating and redirecting towards um, white middle class men who use, use alone, we might actually inadvertently create an even deeper inequity for indigenous women. So 
that's a very brief example of how uh, a simple thing like data aggregation, um, uh, even, even when gender is considered, you need to consider both gender and other intersecting factors 